I wanted to do two things, uh, and they're informed by two different projects. One was to try to talk about a very specific text of uh, Rancière, and the other was to show some examples of my, my own work, because the title of my talk is um, related to my own uh, photographic practice. So I wanted to try to introduce these things. Um, problem, of course, is that might just end up as a sort of schizophrenic experience for you. Is there's, um, and I thought that maybe there's some way to put these two things together, but no, they're going to be here like a montage. So I'm going to show you little pieces of my work and and then I'm going to talk about Rancière. So these will be separate, but in the same talk. So it's like a montage. So maybe I'm trying to effect, in a way, in the form of the presentation, a Rancière type um, work. And the reason that I want to put these two things together is because I've just finished trying to write, I say trying to write a book on art photography that I was commissioned to write by the Tate. And, uh, and Rossi has been very useful for trying to think about how one would write about art photography today. That's my interest in Rossi. The other is I'm putting together a, a, a book of collected, of my own work, a monograph of old work. Um, I was quite early to do digital work in the UK, and most of this work was not um, it was exhibited, but it was not documented. So, I'm trying to put together a catal um, a series of works uh, from older periods. So, some of the work that I will show is very old work; some of it's more recent. Um, but they all speak in some way to this idea of the alterity of the image. And alterity, if it's unfamiliar, is really another word for otherness. And I think of this otherness category in, in three ways. Social, in a social sense, a very obvious social sense that when I travel abroad I meet others who are social others in some way that I don't know, unfamiliar, foreign, and same for you when you go somewhere, in a very obvious sense of other which of course has many historical, political questions around it, with colonialism and so forth. Um, otherness in terms of uh, myself, not just me, but everybody, the, the way that one is never fulfilled as an identity, that one is al always, in a way, undermined by the other, which originally is somehow your parents' images, which are integrated, and, and then the others. This is a psychoanalytic idea of other. And a third other, which is what I find exciting or interesting in Rancière's work, which is the otherness of the image. And this is what I find uh, very useful in, in his work. This European Letters from 1992. This is the first digital work I ever made. The analogical images that were scanned and turned into data so that one could merge together in the same image uh, both words and writing. And these were made at the time that the UK was about to join the European Union. And there was a huge anxiety, as there still is, about this little island belonging to the big continent. And so I put together an alphabet of words that were beginning to appear around this uh, issue of joining up and the anxiety of belonging. So these words uh, were put together with images. So you have an image, you have a word, and you have something that's between a sort of graphic sign, which is a both word and image between them, that has a relationship to the image. You can see, obviously, in the O of the mouth of Tintin, 
an itinerant traveller in Europe and beyond. And uh, the O is a link to the word, so it's a kind of transitional... Well, this is a very old word, to show that alterity has been around in my world for a long time. So, the title, The Alterity of the Image, comes from a subsection of the title essay, The Future of the Image, by Jacques Rancière. And Rancière gave this talk, The Future of the Image, the essay, at the um, National Center of Photography in Paris in 2002. It has a specificity. It was addressed to an audience concerned with photography. See the first essay in the book, The Future of the Image. Uh, and what's interesting about Rancière's uh, title, The Future of the Image, is for me it, it reminded me immediately of this book, uh, Sigmund Freud's The Future of an Illusion. Uh, this turns out not to be an accident that actually Rancière, I can convict him on repeated felonies of borrowing titles from Freud. So Jacques Rancière's book, Aesthetics and Its Discontents, is very clearly borrowed from Sigmund Freud's <coughs> Civilization and Its Discontents. So you find that Rancière is, um, without saying it, referring quite explicitly to existing texts. And the aesthetic unconscious would be very obviously the text you probably know by Frederick Jameson on uh, literary avant-garde work, the political unconscious. So you can see that Rancière is quite playful, even the, the very title of these texts, um, to other texts. He's very uh, uh, conscious of this uh, connection. The future of an illusion is a interesting reference, uh, because Freud's essay, one of his most popular essays, it has to be said, in, in terms of popular literature, um, is about the um, wish of humans and civilizations to have illusions. And he talks specifically about religion. That's the example that he, he worked with, because Freud was a famous Viennese Jewish intellectual is very interested in the convictions that religion uh, brought and in a way the question that he's preoccupied that book, The Future of an Illusion is the issue of um, how we can live as kind of mature civilizations without giving in to in a way the simplistic wish that there is some great creator who made all this, who is kind of you know, looking after us, this idea um, of it. And he, he adds an 11th commandment to religion, which is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing text, it's very hostile to religion, and it's, the 11th commandment is, thou shalt not question, this is the fundamental point, and he, he goes on and on about the uh, horrors that religion has created, which of course we still live in right now. Um, Rossier makes absolutely no reference to this book at all, except the quotation of the title. But it's quite clear, I think, that Rossier is kind of thinking in the way that Freud was thinking. Freud in 1927 was preoccupied with the dominance of religious thought. Um, he also, in his other text, Civilizations, Discontents, makes some interesting remarks about um, communism you know, and what happens if you, if you abolish religion. He says that the systems that are invented in its place tend to take on the characteristic of a religion, which is a, a monotheistic uh, structure, which one could see in the Soviet system, for example, or in Chinese communism. So he's not saying there's some simple solution. He's really concerned with the problem of illusion. Um, and so for Rancière to take this as the title of his book is 
is fascinating because I think, in a way, what he's doing is trying to deal with the same problem that Freud was dealing with, which is the future of the image is the question of, of the, if you like, the illusions that we live with, which are predominantly through images. And this is his fundamental argument. Um, like Freud, there's no solution to the future. I think you know, a lot of people pick the book up, The Future of the Image, as though there's an answer to what is going to happen. Like Freud's book on the future of an illusion, he's really asking questions about the present um, situation. And in the small section of this book, uh, chapter, The Future of, of an Illusion, Rossier talks about uh, a film. So I'd just like to show you a clip from this film. It may well be there's a sort of theme of animals that's going to appear um, after yesterday as well. But let me sh just show you the clip. I have to go out of this and into... So, so he writes about this uh, sequence. I'll, I'll talk about it after you've seen it. Balthazar, je te baptise au nom du Père et du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. Ainsi soit-il. Probably not a film we should watch, but um, this is the beginning of the film. Uh, and Rossier writes about this. Um, I'll read you what he says. It's on page three, The Alterity of the Images. So the title of the film is All Azad Balthazar. Balthazar is clearly the name of the donkey that they've given it. And All Azad means by chance. So I guess the title is um, It's the Luck of Balthazar or the Chance, uh, something like that. And, and the story. The story of the film follows the life of this donkey and the young girl whose hand comes down the donkey to stroke it at the beginning of this shot. Her name is Mary. Um, so here's what he says. The images of all Hazard Balthazar are not primarily, primarily manifestations of the properties of a certain technical medium but operations, relations between a whole and parts, between a visibility and a power of signification and effect associated with it, between expectations and what happens to meet them. Let us look at the beginning of the film. The play of images has already begun when the screen is dark. With the crystalline notes of a Schubert sonata, it continues while the credits flash by against a background that conjures up a rocky wall, a wall of dry stone, or boiled cardboard. We're not quite clear what this dark grey background is. And then the sonata, the Schubert sonata, is cut with the braying of the donkey. You hear it going, ee, or ee, you know, so you, sorry, no, bad imitation. And then the sonata resumes. So you have a disruption to the beautiful sonata by Schubert. And then the the sound of bells, which carries on into the first shot of the film. Then we see the donkey, or a fragment of it, at its uh, suckling its mother, and then the hand comes down as the camera pans up. So you have all of these movements. You never see the whole of the donkey, you see a fragment of it. And as the camera moves up, you hear the child say, we must have it, i.e. they want the donkey. And the father, who we don't see him say this in the shot, says no. 
And then without explanation, in the next shot of the film, you see them walking away with the donkey. So the first scene shows this girl carrying, running her hand down, it's a beautiful shot, the donkey. She wants it. Father says no. Cut. She's got it. They're walking away with it. And then in the next scene, you see them baptise it. Uh, Balthazar, they awarded its name. So, Rossier introduces this image, set of images, to talk about alterity of the image. And I think it's quite complex, the way that he writes this. Uh, it's very dense, the, the way that he writes. But by the time he gets to this, he's already <coughs> introduced the distinction between the image and the visual. So images is a, or the image is a term we should reserve for different types of uh, image which are not necessarily visual. So they may well be acoustic sound or tactile or created through words. And this is very important. I think this is the, the really interesting thing that in a way Rancière is doing is rethinking the way that we categorize different mediums. And he's rejected completely uh, the existing art historical models that we have from Clement Greenberg of modernism, which was about medium specificity. But he also rejects the kind of modern mediological discourse, which wants to throw everything together. He wants to keep the distinctions between these forms, but he recognizes that images that the production of images is a practice across them. And you know, this, this for me is the really important uh, argument that he's making. He enables us to reposition the way we think about these different mediums or practices, which is exactly what we need right now um, because of all the things that have been happening technologically and so on. So there's a distinction between the image and the visual that he makes that's really important. And his argument is that the, the image exceeds the visual form. So vis visibility and image are separate, yet interrelated. And the clip from uh, Bresson's film on Balthazar is to try to kind of get inside the images to, to, to show how this operates um, actually in the work itself. And this also for me distinguishes Rossier apart from many other philosophers who write about art who have always been highly reluctant to kind of get inside an image and talk about how it actually operates. This is you know, one, one of the exciting things about him. He's, he's willing to get his sort of hands dirty by talking about particular images. And so he, if you, if you read the, the, the passage around Balthazar, he kind of takes it apart in a classic um, formal or semiotic analysis of the, of the picture of it. So it's made up of formal contrasts. You have the very dark fur of the donkey and this white hand that slides down. It's a you know, wonderful contrast between, between them. Um, so the clip in the film focuses on gestures, on the hand, uh, on movement of the hand. In the baptism, it's the same. You never see the entire donkey. It's reduced to the water being dropped on the nose of the donkey. You see the, the hand. You never see the entire figures. And he goes on to say, these are procedures that create and retract meaning. They ensure and undo the link between perceptions, actions, and effects. So he's trying to say that even though we're looking at um, visible images, there's something in showing things with images, in, 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 in visual images, that hides something too. Um, this is also quite crucial. This is one point. 
he's making about this. The other point he's making in argument about the film, I mean, Robert Bresson's work is a, you know, this is a celebrated work. It's a, it's a very unusual film. It's not a kind of orthodox documentary. It's a very uh, disjunctive film in the way that it's, it's made. But he's using this film to argue also that there's something very similar uh, in the practice of Bresson that happens in certain novels. So that the images that are created by Bresson's film, in this clip, for example, could equally, equally well be created through words in a novel by Flaubert, or he gives many Balzac and so on. You know, examples of French, of course, because French philosophers rarely refer beyond uh, France. <laughs> so this is the crucial uh, introduction of this clip. The alterity of the image, then, is this uh, kind of doubling. Or, uh, on the one hand, something which is, I'll come back to this, something which is made visible, which also hides something, and something which uh, is related to these um, other aspects of image that I re refer to. And he goes on, Breton's image is not a donkey, two children, and an adult. We can't reduce this experience to simply techniques of close-up camera, uh, movements of dissolves, but operations which couple and uncouple uh, meanings. And to the phrase that he uses yesterday, that couple and uncouple the visible and the sayable. And the sayable, in his writing, it seems to be, a, in a way, a fancy word for talking about language or words or speech, and the, vis the visible for um, the visual. And the images can cut a, images, regime of images cuts across uh, these different things. So this is his sort of opening gambit in the, in the text. And there's clearly an argument going on about whether film is an art or television is an art. And he's not interested in these kind of, these sort of sociological arguments about television being popular culture and cinema being art. His idea of the uh, aesthetic regime that was beautifully talked about yesterday is not embedded specifically in art. It's a, it's a specific practice across any of these um, technological forms or institutions. So the aesthetic regime has a specific function he argues, to produce dissemblances and not resemblances. And this is where he comes to photography uh, as well. And he actually locates the origin of this idea of the aesthetic regime in the 19th century as um, the founding moment. And of course the 19th century is the highlight of the novel, of photography. These are the new uh, mediums, in, in a sense. And I think what Rancière is borrowing on, if you already know the work of Michel Foucault in The Order of Things, where he talks about re regimes as defining certain historical moments, I think Rancière is actually talking about a modern world experience that we have now that started in the 19th century, that he calls this ascetic regime. And what we have the sense of is that there has been such a transformation culturally that we have to reformulate our attitude towards what we consider art and what we consider um, those, which, those images uh, and practices which continue to serve a consensus, a social consensus of how we uh, conform in a way, and those which uh, have a dissensus, which are in a way slightly antagonistic at least towards that. So again, there are these 
oppositions that work in his work between resemblance, dissemblance. This is the work, this is my first work uh, I ever showed. It's called Perfect Harmony. It's five panels. It looks like this. Panel one. So in the gallery, you'd see it like this. You'd have to walk up really t close to see the text because it's tiny. And when you were that close to read the text, you couldn't see the picture, so you'd have to walk back. You couldn't have them both at the same time. Text reads, he said, driving gives me time to put things in perspective. Panel two. She said, why are you so anxious to be in control? He spoke only to offer instructions. She thought their relationship to be monotonous. Work was distant from their minds, the day almost forgotten. So you have two rows of photographs, one clearly a sort of journey, road movie, the others in a garage. And when I first took this work to Photographer's Gallery in London, which was a sort of modernist gallery, they looked at the work and said, hmm, we like these images at the top. Maybe if you um, uh, could represent them, we, you know, bring some more, we, we'd be interested in maybe showing them. This is, well, actually, it's a diptych with text. This is a disjunctive work. So I took it to uh, uh, avant-garde community-based documentary gallery in the East End of London and showed them the same work. And they said, we really like these documentary pictures of the garage <laughs> in East London. Maybe if you bring some more, we could um, show them. You find here that the institution is looking already, I mean, I use this as an example of the way that you know, your, your work doesn't necessarily fit a context. And it took about 15 years before anyone was really interested to look at that work. Okay, back to rules here. The aim of the aesthetic regime is to produce dissemblances, not resemblances. This seems to offer a particular problem for photography, because photography is a machine aimed precisely to make resemblances between, between things. This is what I found was interesting in his argument for uh, a book on art photography. You know, what, what is it about art that makes it different from non-art photography? This is a big problem if you work in photography because, you know, photography is everywhere. You could have a kind of tautological social distinction, which was that any photography that's shown by legitimate art gallery must be art. This would be a purely tautological definition. You know, so if it's included in an art museum, it must be art. This is one way. This is not the way that Rancière is, is, is kind of interested in it. Um, so this question of how photography creates a dissemblance becomes kind of important. And the Bresson movie, I think, is an example of that. Uh, Rossier doesn't go back to it. But it's kind of the example of that uh, idea of creating an image which disrupts 
uh, something inside it. I've been trying to give you uh, an example. And in a way, what Rancière is doing is trying to rework what had already been uh, known from Roland Barthes' work on photography and the book that everyone who writes on photography thinks is the book on photography, Camera Lucida, with its distinction between a studium and a punctum. Studium being the social message of a picture and the punctum being something which is, uh, he calls it a, a signifier without a signified. It's something in the picture which has a meaning, but you don't know what the meaning is. So it's an enigma to you. It's not a riddle. A riddle always has a solution. An enigma, there is never any solution to an enigma. Uh, it is an enigma. You know, it's not a game. So the punctum is something which is unresolvable, in a sense. And Rossier refers to Bart, and I think he kind of critiques him for falling into a kind of romanticism of the ineffable in the picture. But uh, this is clearly pointing to the question that when we look at the visual image at a, at a picture, which appears to be the resemblance of something, there are images which create a disturbance at the same time in the resemblance. That is something is slightly antagonistic to that sense of resemblance. And this is what I think Rancière is talking about as a, as a, as a type of dissemblance. And Rancière, unlike Bart, is reluctant to attach that to any particular uh, technique or device because he doesn't want to reduce it to the essence of a medium or, or of a technique. Rancière tries to keep his argument about dissemblance sort of above any medium specificity. So he's, you know, this is the, the great advantage of coming from philosophy, one can do that, I guess, um, keep, keeping that kind of distance to it. And this actually is, is incredibly valuable, I think, because it, it, there's a kind of levelling effect of the different mediums, which is, which is really, how we need to, really how we need to think about them now. So, uh, Rossier goes on to take up this question of um, photography and the peculiarity that photography seems to have replaced the other uh, dominant medium of painting as the sort of default discourse of major art institutions. So you have a kind of medium uh, orientated towards resemblance which has taken over art when the function of art is to create a dissemblance. So if we, if we think of our kind of modern everyday lives, as I think you were saying yesterday, you know, re resemblance works through repetition. The, the point of it is it's con utterly conventional. So if I asked you to conjure up in your mind a picture of Paris, there would be some variation, but we'd all have the same image, right? It's not, it may be visual, it may be acoustic, it may be a, a madeleine, it may be whatever, but it, it'll, it'll be an image. It's, it's, it's kind of already there. You know, this, is, this is what uh, Rancière is very clear about. This is not the function of art to repeat these. The function of art must surely be to kind of inter, inter, interfere with this. And he's, he's making this as an argument for the continued relevance of art against uh, a kind of mediological regime that we live in, which is dominated by images, visual, acoustic, and so forth, that he's wanting to hang on to some idea of art which has a function, has a political function, with a small p, a critical function. Um, and this is what he's trying to sort of work, work through. I did warn you this might be slightly schizophrenic. And then he moves to introduce um, 
what I think are you know, really the important uh, key, key introduction in, in this essay is um, three categories of image that have to negotiate non-art images in their very constitution. Let me try to give examples of these. These are three categories. Uh, naked, ostensive. So, um, an example of these are actually photographic. The naked image will be uh, an image that was not first made as an art image, but finds itself up finds itself ending up in the art institution because of its uh, role. And he prefers to use the word naked instead of document or documentary, but I think this is to avoid the problems of those terms. That <coughs> you know, Documentary as a, as a adjective and the document as a noun tend to uh, get mixed up. Um, and the, ex the image he actually talks about is this, is this photograph by George Roger taken at the uh, Belson concentration camp in 1945. So there's an image like this you can find in art exhibitions, of which there have been many, particularly around Holocaust, um, have ended up in art. And um, so the, the, the primary function of them is that they are a document of something, that, that one has a sort of faith in them as an image, as a document of something. So here you see a Gestapo officer being made to carry the dead bodies um, from the camp. Such an image would seem to have a kind of pure um, reference to itself, but Rossi argues this is kind of not possible anymore, and he, he says... It, for him, at least, it's not possible to think of this image without thinking of Rembrandt's flayed oxes. Uh, and he refers to this painting, or the series of paintings by Rembrandt specifically, that one cannot, even when one looks at a, a, a photograph like that, it's hard to dissociate from other ones. In fact, that wasn't the image for me that I thought of when I, when I looked at Rod, Roger's um, picture. It was this photograph by Brassai, which is, uh, you know, if you're a photography student, you tend to know Brassai's work early on, of these rather happy uh, Parisian workers carrying out slabs of meat. So his point is that the idea that an image refers to something that we don't know is always contaminated by other images, even these ones which are seen to be most pure, or naked, as he calls. So that's the category of uh, naked. The metamorphic uh, image would be one that has absorbed something from mass media. I'll read you that his um, little... Or did I, maybe I put it in here, actually. Yeah, metamorphic. According to this logic, it's impossible to delimit a specific sphere of presence, isolating artistic operations and products from forms of circulation of social and commercial imagery and from operations interpre interpreting this imagery. The images of art possess no peculiar nature of their own that separates them in stable fashion from the negotiation of resemblances and the discursiveness of symptoms. Good, quite enigmatic writing. But I, I, I think, you know, in a sense, the metamorphic is, is best given an example of in postmodern art, where in that, all that work from the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, where clearly artists were taking directly from, in the case of Cindy Sherman, from film, films that she'd seen and kind of making images based on that. Richard Prince directly using... Uh, little sections of advertisements and simply reproducing them so that the work becomes like a sort of semiotic analysis or media critique. It's like an early Roland Barthes in mythologies, that the, the artwork becomes entirely based on critiquing what already exists in the, in the media sphere. So this is what he calls the met metamorphic image, that they're obviously metamorphosizing from non-art into art. And I think he's arguing that there's some kind of potential critical 
criticality, if you like, in that, in that process. So those are the two categories. And the third one, the ostensive. Um, and the example, one of the examples he gives is, is this. And the ostensive, if you're unfamiliar with it and had to look it up in the dictionary like me, in the English dictionary, it refers to pointing to something else. Uh, and actually looking further, of course, the ostensive is also a category in, in Wittgenstein's work. But interestingly, it was also uh, a semiotic concept in the Prague linguistic circle in the 1920s. And Jan Murakowski, the people around him, had this concept of the ostensive sign which is used much more in uh, theatre studies than in, in visual art. And it's the idea that um, when, for example, on the stage, if you put a chair on the stage, the chair on the stage is not just a chair, but it's pointing to the idea of the chair in a, in a more general sense. So it's always pointing to something beyond itself. And I suppose that's what Rancière has in mind when he picks this photograph by Alfred Stieglitz, the famous photomodernist of uh, Marceau Duchamp's even more famous urinal, you know, the, the, one of the key prototypes, as you know, of the ready-made uh, object. So you have this industrial object that's kind of uh, de-identified in the way it's photographed uh, slightly by putting it on its back. Uh, it's a very unfamiliar sight even to a man. So, uh, I guess to a women audience it's even more unfamiliar, but to a man that's not the viewpoint of a urinal, right? That's a, so at some level Stieglitz's picture is, a, is, is, is disrupting the resemblance of the urinal to itself. Uh, but the ostensive function here is pointing to something beyond itself. So we have these three categories, um, which he argues are in kind of relation to each other and themselves. I think for my purposes, I try to borrow these categories to um, have a kind of tripartite, triangular distinction of types of practice, particularly relevant for photography. Maybe it works for other, other uh, modes too. But the naked is the document. The photograph is a document which relates to lots of archive work, postmodern which inevitably, the metamorphic, I think there's a strong kinship there, and the ostensive as a conceptual. And indeed, there's lots of conceptual art from the 60s and 70s where the main, the main work of the, the, the pictures of it, whether it's a video or a photograph, is pointing to something from everyday life in, in particular. So these categories, I think, uh, have a, a, a really important role because they they start to remap the way we might think uh, what kind of art images are doing in relationship to non-art. And they all propose quite distinct types of relationship to them. OK, I have one more thing I'll show you. Uh, I know we're further down on the map. I was uh, teaching for, I was invited to teach in uh, the academy in Estonia, which I did for five or six years. I helped them set up a photography department there with other people. And uh, I was asked to make some work about being there. And I discovered that the film that I loved by Andrei Tarkovsky Stalker was shot in Tallinn. Well, a lot of it was shot in Tallinn anyway. So I, I became interested to link uh, this film to my own experience of being in a foreign city because the great thing about Stalker is if you know the, the film uh, or if you don't it's a science fiction film with no gadgets it's not a sort of Hollywood science fiction film there's no technology in the science fiction um, aliens arrive they contaminate a territory which is cordoned off nobody's allowed to go there it's rumoured that there's a space inside this alien zone where if you walk into a room, all of your desires will be fulfilled. The stalker is a character who is able to navigate the, the strange laws of this alien place and take people to the room. And the plot of the movie 
It's an incredibly visual movie. There's very little soundtrack. Uh, very sorry, very little um, dialogue. There's music that's very important to it. But there's very little um, dialogue. The film struck me as a brilliant metaphor for what was happening to the city of Tallinn at that time of being transformed into a kind of capitalist city from uh, the end of a Soviet era. Uh, it seemed alien to many of the students that I talked to because of the changes, but it also seemed alien to me as a Western capitalist, blah, 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 um, uh, because it still had a Sovietness. So it had this kind of strangeness. So I was very interested to borrow this logic of the film to um, make some uh, photographic projects. So I went to the dam where this part is shot in the film and so on and went to see the places this obviously is not in the, in my, um, this is a part of the film at the end, the room that they go to where your desires will be fulfilled. And of course it, what it turns out in the film is that your desires um, that are fulfilled may not be the desires that you actually consciously had in mind. Um, and it's quite a tragic uh, ending. So I was interested to try to represent, let's say, uh, the city of Tallinn, my experience of it, not as, as though I could know this other place with the authority of knowing, which would be to turn it into something familiar, right? So the other becomes familiar. This is what documentary photographers do. They domesticate the experience of the foreign, which I don't think should be in some ways. I like this quote from Baudelaire, with an eye, an eye with an insatiable appetite for the non-eye at every instant, rendering and explaining it in pictures more living than life itself, which is always unstable and fugitive. This sort of tendency to kind of digest the other as yourself. It's, 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 so I'm opposed to that and to try to keep its foreignness in it. And so i just show you very quickly some of the pictures from this, which are very well travelled now, uh, old work. Um, and we're shown like this in Tallinn. Very strange, this is from the Chicago version. And then ended up as a book called uh, Zone, obviously quoting the, the film with the blank screen of the movie too. And then... Uh, as I went back every year or so to, or twice a year to teach, I could see the city was changing uh, quite rapidly. I was invited to do another project uh, on it for a, a show on tourism. So I decided to go back to Tallinn as a tourist. Um, and I was also interested, to give you an example of this, um, not the first photographer to go there, of course, Henry Cartier-Bresson's book, great book about Russia. Obviously, it's about the Soviet Union, actually, not about Russia. Um, and it has four pictures from Tallinn, all aimed at a French domestic audience, it seemed to me. Um, a nice sort of, you know, girl. And I was intrigued by this photograph, which locals in Tallinn told me used to be the KGB building at the time that Cartier-Bresson was there and took this, this Cartier-Bresson's photograph. So there's some sort of irony going on in this and whether Cartier-Bresson knew that this was the KGB building at the time or not, uh, uh, no one seemed to know, but it seemed to be some sort of irony. So this is talent. Now, I went to the street and if you turn around in the opposite direction, this is what you see mm. now. So this, in a sense, for me, was the turning point of transformation of this uh, period. So I was invited to go back as a tourist, and I thought, uh, I will go back as a tourist on EasyJet. I'll take the party plane to, Lund to Tallinn, uh, and just for convenience sake, I'll show you this as a, as a, a, a piece uh, that works by itself. <laughs> 